it is. Uh, welcome to the talk. We're going to hear what Kyle Somani does in a bear market. But before we get to that, um, I'm joined today by my <laughs> wonderful guests. We want to dive into what's going on in the market, how it's changed in a year. I remember this time last year in Lisbon, it was a very different kind of conference, a very different kind of market. And the top's really blown off of it. I'm sorry, my voice is gone. I've been talking about the Phillies too much. But um, the top's really blown off on the market. and. It's a different environment, and we want to hear from these paragons of the investing world in crypto, how they're approaching it. So we'll start off with that question. Kyle, what do you do in a bear market? Uh, mostly I just call Amy and ask her what she's doing, and I copy her. <laughs> All right, well. My vice versa. So, uh, it, oh, go, go on. Uh, no, I mean, honestly, the same thing we do in bull, bull markets, like meet entrepreneurs, read, think, talk to people, write checks. Like, it's slower now than it was a year ago, but same core, core objective, same core substance. Are you seeing a difference in the types of projects, the, uh, the, 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 the speed with which deals are closing, the activity in the space? There, certainly there's some difference now than, the, than relative to a year ago. Like, how are you experiencing that from your side of the thing? Y'all wanna, wanna take it? Sure, so I think overall the speed to deal closing has definitely slowed down. I think that you certainly have to make a few concessions to the market, but people take different approaches at different shops. At Sino, we don't outsource our uh, due diligence, so our speed to close probably has not changed materially, but overall in the market, for sure, there's a huge difference in uh, both the the number of deals, especially at smaller, size tr uh, check, smaller check sizes, and then for sure speed to close. And let's talk about due diligence. I mean, one of the big stories for, my, for myself this year was about the Sabre ecosystem and understanding what is actually going on behind the scenes of some projects. So one, one in particular, it, this wasn't a case where I, I don't know if investors were, were lied to, but the public certainly was, and it was a case where due diligence might not have been done to the extent that it should have been. So, Amy, just from your perspective, like how are VCs approaching due diligence and what is their what are their obligations uh, in this space it's definitely changed quite a bit since last year during a bull market there's a ton of fomo i would say and we're talking about how like you know deals were getting done like term sheets were signed within like 24 hours um, and uh, and and so the the thing is like someone would need to would commit and then immediately the rest of the round would come together almost without almost any diligence it was just around the signal of the lead investor a lot of times um, and uh, that's not you know super healthy i would say especially because a lot of the projects um, you know maybe not as like long term oriented uh, you know not uh, um, different qualities of, of you know, skill sets and like, like talents out there as well, and, and just thinking around about what they're building. And so now it, things have slowed down. I think it's good for everyone involved. And um, I, I still don't know that everyone is. I would say doing on-chain diligence, for example, and actually like checking into some of the numbers that the comp uh, that the projects are are saying, but more like reference checks on the founders, seeing like um, there's a, the founders, a lot of the channels also have a longer track record of working in the space. And so that in itself kind of speaks volumes to, again, whether they're long-term oriented or not. And I think um, all that's like healthier. And Min, you're probably the, the best position on this stage at the moment to talk about the transition between different ecosystems. What, what do you see the, the differences between, let's say, the Ethereum ecosystem and the Solana ecosystem from a venture investing perspective? I think right now we're squarely in a multi-chain world. So, you know, it's not so much that one ecosystem is more resilient than the other. Um, in fact, I think one thing that was really exciting about um, Solana over the last, say, 18 months was just a number of new developers and new participants that they brought in crypto um, in a way that made it very, very accessible. And we saw a lot of interesting innovation building, building the Solana ecosystem that we hadn't really seen. Um, Ethereum that has been very, very focused on protocol infrastructure and scaling, uh, particularly on the NFT side. I think like, you know, Solana has a very vibrant ecosystem. So we, we really think about it more from the perspective of like what chain is most suitable for building what kind of project and assess it accordingly and especially for founders like well why did you choose this particular L1 not just from a technical architecture point of view but also from a community building perspective because the shape and structure of each L1 ecosystem is very different. 
And Kyle, do you think that there's a, sorry, my, my voice is cracking if I go too high. Um, sorry. <coughs> uh, fr uh, that idea of uh, different L1s for different purposes, it, in, a, in this sort of market, it's hard to get new people into crypto, right? We're sort of, no, we're not preaching to the choir, but there's the people who are already in, the, who are excited about building, excited about investing, excited about whatever it is in this crazy world that we all live in. Um, so it's a matter of appealing to them, wh regardless of where they are. What's like the value proposition of Solana at this moment? Um, yeah, we. Um, you, you know, if you look back to the original keynote Vitalik gave uh, when he launched Ethereum, uh, this is January 2013, I think, or maybe January 2014. Um, but in it, he outlined his kind of motivation for building Ethereum, which was hey, people were built, had ideas for interesting things beyond Bitcoin. There was Namecoin, there was a few other things of that, of that era, I forget the other ones. Um, and they were all building ran full chains with consensus and different ETXO sets and mining and whatever. Uh, and it was really complicated if you wanted to launch a single app to deal with all that complexity. Uh, and so he launched Ethereum because he said, aha, what if you can abstract all of that common stuff and just have a layer to write smart contracts, right? And that was, that was how Ethereum was born. It was a very like, clear distillation of like, the core problem uh, and then like, an elegant solution to the problem. What, what's kind of happened is Ethereum has been dealing with, with scaling has been like they kind of broke that core premise of saying, well, look, just like, don't think and throw a contract on the chain, and that's it. And like, that's what made ETH uh, L1 so successful was just like, the dumb simplicity of the whole system. Um, no thing required, throw it down, that's it. Um, and, and that very much is what Solana represents, and that's why we've been so drawn to it from the very beginning, uh, which is like it maintains that sheer simplicity. Um, in a, if you look at like an iPhone, right, like Apple kind of sort of controls the whole iPhone. They control the hardware, the operating system, all that stuff. You need a cell phone carrier, and like really those two pieces make it work. But if you look at any actual blockchain application, you need an L1, you need uh, on-ramps, you need uh, wallets, you need indexing and query providers, you need application providers, you need whatever, all these other things. And it's actually the fact that all of those things are more or less built by disparate parties, and like they all actually come together and work, and you can actually have a real functional application, is actually pretty amazing. Um, and uh, I kind of think about like, you know, what is the total amount of ecosystem complexity required to produce a, um, and, you know, a, a very elegant consumer experience? And, uh, as you look at all of the other approaches to scaling, which, which have merits, they just like keep increasing social complexity of the system as a whole. Um, and that's always struck me as like a, a pretty big bottleneck to overall rate of innovation. Because again, the more parties need to coordinate on more stuff, inherently overall innovation must slow down to, to deal with that. Um, and, and I've always loved the beauty of, of the Solana approach for that reason. Uh, let's switch gears for a second and talk about Twitter. Uh, Matty Sino over here. I think you're probably everyone's favorite on the stage. No, no, no offense to the rest uh, of us. Probably a little, little polarizing, but a, a go ahead. A little polarizing, that's okay. We like a little polarizing. Um, let's talk about perceptions, uh, how VCs are positioning themselves from a, you know, the public perception point of view. What's this, what is your approach to that? Sure. And how do you think that's changed, if at all? in this market? Sure, so I'm not necessarily my, sure my approach would be the recommended approach other than to say that I think the most important part is that it's super important to come across as, as authentic and genuine, that for sure. And then I think that I would add to the fact that uh, in TradFi, it's okay to be a little standoffish. It's okay to be above the fray, and you can you can really get away with that as a VC and pr pr probably viewed positively, frankly. But I think most elements of crypto are far more social, and so to the extent that that works for you, it probably makes sense to lean into that. But again, you know, you really just have to start with being genuine and authentic. So I would phrase in that way. Do you th uh, th so the approach doesn't change at all, regardless of the market. It's just make sure that. Oh uh, no, I'm do. not sure why that would be. Um, it's, it's not obvious to me why, if a person is trying to be genuine and authentic, that it would change, regardless of market conditions. I mean, look, ev you know, crypto Twitter is euphoric one day and despondent the next day. Um, we take a long-term view, so our uh, way of engaging with the industry is not super going to change day to day. 
I, I think you, you got to kind of just uh, be accessible, be genuine, be <coughs> pro-social, and then, you know, just kind of vibe in, in a, a way that makes sense to yourself and your team and uh, is authentic. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a long-term view, I mean, in crypto, I've been in crypto, let's see, uh, three years at Coindesk, five or six, uh, just playing around in different f different forms. Mm -hmm. We've all been around for a, a, a while now, but a year is a long time in crypto. Uh -huh. um, so in the long term, one year ago, Amy, did you think that the market would be where it is? Like, what was your outlook then for where we would be today, um, one year ago? A year ago was, um, <coughs> I mean, it was like peak bull market. I mean, it felt like it was peak bull market, to mm -hmm. be honest. Um, what were the signs? Like, all of it's like, like the, the, was it the, the people on the, on the subway you would hear, oh, you know, I'm buying Doge or like, what would um, the, what, when you say it was peak bull market, how did that make Well, from a venture investor perspective, uh, there, I think it was like, we were just starting to do deals where it, the valuation did not make sense. And then the kind of lack of diligence and uh, didn't make sense. And um, it was, uh, it, it, it there was it's always impossible to f um, to predict timing so I don't think anyone predicted necessarily like the timing of the bear market just like no one can predict the next even like micro cycle but like the next bull market although probably pretty tied to macro markets these days um, but I think yeah like when you get that feeling of this doesn't feel this feels a little like reckless <laughs> in terms of how rounds are getting done and um, what people were saying um, uh, that's when I think like people who have been who have been through multiple cycles usually start getting a little bit more um, conservative and start pulling back um, capital deployment as some voices in the room were it was interesting because I mean we really have been in a multi-year bull cycle even outside of crypto and um, in a world in which most entrepreneurs in this vintage and actually also investors haven't actually been through a bear cycle. Mm -hmm. um, so I was at Lightspeed when uh, we went through the beginning of, um, at the beginning of COVID, there was maybe like a, co like a month of uh, when, when everything kind of froze from a capital deployment perspective. And a lot of people at that point thought that maybe that was the beginning and it, that was clearly not true. And perhaps we're in like a much longer um, bear cycle right now. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, the timing is impossible to, um, predict, but I would say usually when you're like people are really kind of pulling back significantly is when you're like okay we're well into the cycle and then um, although the difference this time is that so venture capital really kind of exists in decade long um, cycles like fund cycles and so there has been tens of billions of dollars like raised um, like hundreds of billions actually and and so this this dry powder is, is very much sitting on the side, which is why like, I think a lot of people still observe, even though deployment has slowed down, like valuations for a lot of some of the top teams have really are still remains like fairly high. And to be honest, like, I don't think that's gonna change because people, funds are still sitting on billions of dollars of capital. So it's a different environment than certainly the last bear. When you say uh, that it's still fairly high, do you think that it, that, like the, the valuations still have room to come down? Or do you think that these levels will be maintained or should they be maintained? I mean, like a $100 million valuation for a seed round, pre-product, pre-monetization, like doesn't really make sense to me as is a that really venture a common, investor. Is that a common sight or it's not uncommon? That was very common as of a year ago. Very common. In fact, probably like average, I would say. Like now it's not, but there's still, you know, teams out there kind of anchored at around there. I wonder how of those, you know, let's say 10, $100 million seed rounds, how many, wh where are they now? We need to have like a, a, a reunion show and find out where their valuations <laughs> are one year ago later. Um, I'd say median seed is like 20, if I were to guess right now. But there's a lot of stuff being done in the 12 to 15 range, a lot of stuff being done 25 to 30, depending on the experience of the entrepreneur uh, and the size of the market and stuff. Mm -hmm. But 20 is probably a rough median. Mm -hmm. And Ben, does the, 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 the types of products and teams that pop up change relative to the market? Like, are we seeing different sorts of pitches now because of where the market is? Yeah, I think, you know, we kind of think about things like bear and bull cycles as being everything's a rates game. And especially right now, like, you know, with the macro backdrop, like, sure, DeFi do tokens are down 90%, so are a lot of stocks. 
Um, so I think with that in mind, like the shape of this bear market is quite different from the last one. Um, you know, f one thing that's really interesting is just the entrance of like talented engineers and founders from Web 2 to Web 3. I think particularly after this week, as we saw a lot of big tech, like, you know, make layoffs of more than 10% of the companies, a fair amount of those are going to come to crypto. Like, we certainly haven't seen the stop of, like, just more talented um, founders think about what they can build in crypto that they can't actually do in, you know, Web 2. Um, so that's one thing that's quite encouraging. Um, I think in general, like in bull markets, we see a lot of experimentation, right? So a lot of like, hey, this Ponzi-nomics game will absolutely work one day. And generally, they don't really, but you know, we go along with it because there's a lot of irrational exuberance. Uh, in bear markets, I think teams tend to take more of a disciplined approach with their dry powder, with like runway, a lot more focus on proof points and near-term adoption. Um, we're also seeing a lot more equity rounds um, relative to, say, six to nine months ago. And people are really starting to think, like, okay, if I need a token, like, what do I need a token for? Um, but I do, like, you know, <coughs> emphasize that there's certainly a lot of VC money out there. So we're still seeing things get funded. We're still deploying as well. Um, I do think, like, you know, strong teams can certainly get high valuations, and it's a matter of what you're going for as a founder. Like, because if I look at like some of the L1 comps, they're still trading above a billion. So some investor is going to choose like, hey, I, the seed round at 100 million looks totally reasonable to me. I can underwrite this. Whereas like, you know, I probably share Kyle's approach where, you know, I like it to come a little bit lower just to give us a bit more buffer and the founders as well. Um, so founders, I think, have the, still have some choice in terms of who they want to partner with. And that's the beauty of like, you know, building in Web3 versus in Web2, where I think people are hit a lot more harder um, as a lot of like fintech and e-commerce. Like, you know, that's a lot more impacted than the macro than say we are. And Kyle, is there a difference from one market cycle to the next in the a VC's preference for a token or equity? I, I think that a, a year ago, everyone definitely wanted tokens. I don't know if that's quite the case now, but just from a, you know, allocation of uh, uh, the investment structure, is there a, a shift from token or equity or, you know, SAFT or however you want to call it? Um, I've heard people wanting to do more equity recently. I, I don't fully get why. Um, why not? Uh, well, Multicoin, what we have told our LPs and, and what we are doing is we are a token first fund. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think at our, our venture fund two, we probably 90%-ish token-focused investments, or at least 90% in terms of dollars. I think Venture Fund 3, which we're currently investing out of, probably is on pace for 90%. So that's what we've told our LPs. That's been true, and I think will remain true. Um, I think the reason for that is like we believe our core alpha is investing in token systems. Um, that's where we play. Um, and that's where I want my, my own money in the fund, and that's what we've told our LPs. So like whether the price of Sol is 30 or 200, like I, that shouldn't change. Um, mechanically, the way that most token deals are done is they're done as either a safe or as a priced equity round with a token warrant. Um, so there's legal mechanics of the deal, but you know, like we consider all of those token deals um, because the way we expect to make money is via tokens. Mm -hmm. So regardless of whether they're issuing the tokens to you at the time, you, you want to make sure that your exposure to the, the project Co correct. is in token form. Co correct. There was a time when SAFs were fairly common back in 2018 and 19. That's mostly uh, stopped um, as an instrument. I, I don't fully appreciate all of the, the legal reasons why our, our, our legal team in, in GC can explain all of that, but um, it's, it's now, I'd say, standard that's like equity with a token warrant. Mm -hmm. Now, let's just go down the line. Uh, Matthew, do you have a preference, token versus equity? And did, if you do, has that changed? From sure. One so the, next? The, the first part is it has not changed. I, I would echo what Kyle has said about it seems empirically in the market there's a, a little bit of a shift towards more equity. Our preference has not changed. It's not obvious to me why it would. Um, we are, um, it's my view that certain types of businesses are best suited to equity, certain types of best uh, businesses rather are best suited to token models and many types of businesses are best suited to hybrid models and so really when we evaluate a deal we want to know where is the value actually going to accrue many times it's tokens uh, often though as 
was the case with Wintermute, it, it's, it's equity. So it really depends on what kind of business we're talking about, and then it's a case of uh, evaluating. Ultimately, really, we're trying to say, where's the value going to accrue? And so we assess in that way. But what is so special about our industry is that having token models, uh, including using it as part of a hybrid structure, really opens up all kinds of novel uh, mechanisms, and, and so it's, it's really important to always keep that in mind. And Amy, what about you? What about FTX Ventures? Is there a preference for token or equity? Um, this is more of a personal preference. I completely agree with the comments. I've been a, vent a traditional venture investor for, at this point, almost a decade, and so I am actually most familiar with equity. And so therefore, I think, you know, from the beginning of the year when we launched FTX Ventures, I had it always oriented around this um, equity plus token warrant structure anyway. Um, I think it's become more in vogue. Uh, you know, I think historically, like, I think crypto native investors are very comfortable with investing tokens and they are, they also have the most alpha, like, coming in and out of that. Um, as the lockup periods get longer, though, um, uh, it's, it's harder to, I, I think, because tokens are a lot more volatile in, like, pricing. And so it becomes harder, I think, for a fund manager to kind of, um, Act, like you know, kind of manage that like li liquidity, and so on. The, but on the equity side, you know, especially since so many companies that we Im I had previously invested in ultimately found an exit, actually in acquisition, and so I think there's still some complexities when there's a token involved there. Um, you know, we've actually experienced that on the uh, FTX side as well, on the M&A side, and so yeah, I've I've always invested in both. And let's talk about uh, up-and-coming ecosystems. Uh, we've, we're seeing a lot of pressure on the developer side uh, from Aptos uh, as re really reaching out to a lot of Solana uh, developers. It's saying, come here, play around with us, uh, see what you can do. Um, and I'm wondering if, from a, uh, it will, for me, it's very interesting that Aptos, this is happening in a, the market that it is, because it's, it's, it, this is the, the, the top is blown off, like I said. We're in a different world. It's a little harder to build in this one. I don't know if it's having any impact on their outreach. I'm wondering if it's ha having any impact on your guys' approach to up-and-coming ecosystems, specifically for Aptos, because it's one that is more, there's a bit more tension, I guess you could say, between those two worlds. Uh, Amy, we'll start with you. I mean, do, do you want after uh, I, I guess I'll take it. Um, yeah, it's interesting, right? So when Solana launched, Ethereum was like kind of sort of 100% market share of people building things. No one really builds things in Bitcoin. Um, and there was a, a pretty strongly held view that like Ethereum had won, like, it, you know, that was it. Um, and obviously that, that, that's, no one really thinks that anymore. Um, and so the world's eyes are much more open to a multi-chain thing. So it's kind of like the most important meta comment. Um, and then the second is probably that like, you know, some of the early Ethereum people got fairly wealthy fairly quickly. The early Solana people got really wealthy even more quickly. Um, and then there's a lot of people who, like, were just, like, six to nine months too late to Solana and, and like, didn't experience the same degree of wealth creation. Uh, and a lot of those guys were like, okay, well, like, if Aptos is next Solana, right? Like, and you just kind of naturally see that, that happen. Um, kind of human greed dictates that will happen. Um, so there's been a fair bit of that. I, I don't mean that to discredit the Aptos ecosystem. It's just, like, you have to understand incentives. Um, incentives are everything, and, and there's obviously a fair bit of that at play. Um, that's all fine and well for getting an ecosystem off the ground. Those people are building, like, useful primitives and, and protocols, and, like, there's a lot of just, like, boring stuff you have to build to make an ecosystem function, and, like, that's being built. So um, good for the Aptos ecosystem and doing that and, and launching with a, a pretty strong amount of momentum. Uh, and, yeah, they're coming out of the gate moving very fast. A yeah. comment maybe on just cross-chain is that um, we, uh, you know, on the FTX side, we are cross-chain. You know, we have integrated with over a dozen blockchains at this point and, and continue to. Um, we're, we constantly look for blockchains th that differentiate from an architectural perspective and suitable for, like, different use cases, which kind of led us to, for example, like, investing in Celestia um, in, the, in the Cosmos ecosystem and then, um, you know, SUI as well. Um, that, you know, actually, like, there is, like, a future potential cross-chain world in which, like, again, different use cases are actually, like, in the SUI case, for example, like, kind of, like, non-parallelized 
transactions that um, is interesting. And because the infrastructure layer is still um, pretty early, I would say right now, um, it's, it's an interesting design space for a lot of developers. And uh, we want to support that innovation. So that has led us to investing in, in, um, in multiple ecosystems. And uh, you know, a cross-chain world. A cross-chain world is only going to work if we have systems strong enough that North Korea can't break into them. Um, are the VCs, are you guys investing enough in the security of these, these bridges and these primitives that, that move across different ecosystems? Um, I think the answer, not my thought on the matter is probably no, not specifically any one of you, but we keep seeing hacks all the time. It's clear to me that something has to change because the promise of moving assets to different ecosystems won't work if you can just mint uh, a, a, a to infinity uh, whenever it gets hacked. Uh, uh, Matthew, let's start with you. Sure, I would say empirically we can pretty much assess that not enough time and attention and money is being spent on security across our industry. I think it is uh, a very difficult balancing of incentives, especially in this industry, that leads to that outcome. Although we can certainly see that in traditional technology, um, the security budget is probably much less than what it would optimally be. Um, I, I would say that certainly we have a strong bias towards trying to suss out what teams take ser security more seriously rather than less and trying to encourage our portfolio companies and projects to prioritize a security first approach. Um, but you know, again, ultimately this is an incentive issue and I think there are, are very powerful reasons why we're not quite landing on the sweet spot. I, I hope that changes, but it, it's quite a complex problem in practice. And, and what's your thoughts on the matter? Yeah, I think, you know, when we sort of look at the last 12 months, there are a lot of important and expensive lessons. Um, but, you know, with Bridge, I think it was a unique point of time um, where because of like sort of uh, liquidity mining, there are a lot of bridges were forced to sort of manage the bridging, the infra, the BD, be the first on a new chain to make sure they got the liquidity mining and move tokens across. And when we take a step back, like that's probably not steady state what we need. Like we need more like, you know, roll up to roll up communications, like, you know, different sort of state verifications as opposed to, to only token based bridging use cases. So I do think the requirements are evolving and a lot of good bridging teams are thinking about that. Specifically, um, you know, as we move more towards a roll up world and it's pretty cool, like, you know, with the modularity being a sign of technical m maturity, but definitely like a meme that was popularized by Celestia, um, where we can see developers sort of pick and mix on like, you know, between the consensus and settlement and execution layers and see different sort of VMs work with different roll ups. Uh, we're pretty excited to see all the infra and middleware built around that. And, you know, we have a portfolio company, Eigenlayer, that's actually bootstrapping a lot of this new middleware to try and get developers to inspect the space a bit more. All right, so we've got two minutes left. Uh, we're we're going to try to speed round tackle the question that's on everyone's mind. How much longer are we going to be in this bear market? Keep, keep the 30 seconds. You don't need to give it exact time. We will take it down to the minute. Um, I right. think it's um, pretty tied to macro cycle. So my guess is probably a couple of years. A couple of years. No real opinion. Not, not my cup of tea. Not your cup of tea. Well, what is your cup of tea then? Uh, finding amazing entrepreneurs and helping them win. And that's going to continue uh, no matter what market you're in. That's all I do all day, every day. All right. That's a little short of the 30 seconds, but we'll take it. Matthew. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure this is a super predictable thing, uh, but I do take the bear market, best market approach, and I fundamentally believe that bear markets are where you make your money. It's bull markets later when you find out how much money you made. But uh, look, we take a counter-cyclical approach. This is a great time for us. We'll all have fun later. We'll get there. <laughs> so this is an exciting time. You've bundled up and you're ready to go. <laughs> the serious people are still here, right? The LARPers are gone. I'm okay with that. You know, they'll come back later. <laughs> we got time. This is a, a long term. This is, in my view, this is the biggest uh, technological change since the internet, at least from an American perspective. And I think we're more towards the front end of that than the back end. So people will come and go, and the number of serious people will grow year after year. It seems like uh, healthy. Frankly, <laughs> the, the LARPers will return, but not quite yet. And Min, round us out. Uh, what's your predictions for the, the time well, ahead? 
I started my career in the last, uh, the start of the last financial crisis. I certainly hope this one doesn't last too long, but I think our base case is we start peaking out of a trough in early 2024. Um, you know, as Matthew said, lots more left to be built, so we'll be keeping bu busy until then. Great. Well, thank you all for jo uh, joining me. This has been a fascinating talk about where we stand. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. <laughs>